Okay, welcome everyone to the next or the yeah, the next NHT Insights on Housing webinar. I hope you are excited to learn more about our topic, affordable home ownership, balancing permanent affordability and wealth creation. My name is Calvin Martinez. I'm communications manager here at NHT. And I'm going to start things off with a bit of housekeeping before we get going with our host, our facilitator, and our panelists. So just a couple of things here. Um, while the session is going on, we welcome your questions. We will have a Q&A uh, available. So just hit the chat button that says Q&A and put your questions there. Uh, we will answer those questions uh, at, at a Q&A session at the end of the event or towards the end of the event. Another uh, item, the session is being recorded. So after the session is over, we will be making this available uh, tomorrow for your viewing and for your sharing as well. If your colleagues were not able to make it to the event, feel free to share this webinar with them. Um, and uh, you will get an email regarding that recording. So at this moment, I will be introducing our facilitator, Shalon Fraser from NHT. She is the Senior Director of Lending for National Housing Trust. Thank you, Kelvin. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have this discussion today. This is our Insight on Housing Home Ownership discussion. As Kelvin mentioned, I'm Shalon Fraser, Senior Director of Lending at NHT, where I oversee our lending operations. Um, NHT, so this is really a moment for us because NHT supports both rental and home ownership projects, and we've supported many different models of home ownership. We have a deep history that stems back to our acquisition of the Institute for Community Economics, or ICE, as we call it. And ICE was deeply rooted in shared equity and the support of community land trusts. Since that time, we've grown quite a bit and continued the legacy of ICE. And right now are involved in quite a few initiatives that support affordable home ownership. Some of you may have heard of our Amazon Home Ownership Initiative, which supports the creation of affordable home ownership in three key markets, the Washington, D.C. area, Puget Sound, and Nashville. Or you may have seen the announcement of our work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which supports CLTs or community land trusts that are looking to scale their operations. Uh, kind of going a little bit further back, um, you may have heard word of mouth of our support of tenant-led acquisitions and co-ops in, in our Washington, D.C. office area. Uh, today, we've brought together an esteemed panel of practitioners from the homeownership ecosystem. Each of them have a unique vantage point and perspective on homeownership. My role is to facilitate a conversation of two what some may call competing priorities in affordable homeownership, wealth building versus affordability. Uh, the top of my mind right now, I'm not sure about you, but I feel like some of us might be similar in our thinking. Do they have to compete? Are all types necessary and important? To kick us off, I'll have our panelists introduce themselves and ground us in what brings them to this work. So what's their why? And we'll start with Kara, and then we'll have Jaco and Steve. So I'll ask my panelists if they can pop on camera now and kick us off with introductions. Kara? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and be part of this conversation. Um, I'm Cara Purcell, Director of Innovative Finance at Grounded Solutions. Uh, Grounded Solutions is a John Solutions Network is a national membership organization that consists of nonprofits, local governments, and individuals that are committed to creating and preserving housing with lasting affordability. Uh, we provide training, technical assistance, policy development, technical technology solutions, research and advocacy for our members um, and for the field more broadly. Um, for me specifically, what brings me to, to this line of work, um, I've spent my entire career working um, in nonprofit program operations with a focus on affordable housing and neighborhood stabilization efforts. Um, I've worked on everything ranging from disaster recovery to down, to down payment assistance to foreclosure prevention programs. Um, and through that work, you know, I've really seen how tenuous home ownership can be, both in terms of getting into it in the first place for especially for low income um, households um, and then maintaining it um, through my work with the foreclosure prevention. 
um, and how affordability can be lost over time. So I was really um, attracted to the idea of supporting a sustainable model that provides housing solutions that last. And that's what brought me to Grounded Solutions and to this work. Jay, you're up next. All right, good morning and good afternoon, I guess. I'm Jay Perlmutter, Managing Director of Single Family Development for Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partnership, or AMDP. And I would almost pivot this question a little bit to more what keeps me in this work, and that is just the opportunity to create new homeowners um, and you know, knowing that we're making lasting change, not just for our individual homeowners, but their, their families as we create generational wealth, as well as creating positive impacts on communities that, you know, too often have seen huge amounts of disinvestment, so. And Stephen, I have yeah. you round us up. Sure, um, happy to be with you all today. Uh, I'm Stephen Brown, I'm the Director of Insights and Evidence at the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program. And what brings me to this work is that I am, for a long time, been deeply interested in economic opportunity and um, have been long troubled and, and fascinated by the, the racial wealth gap and approaches to try to figure out how do we understand the sources of it, how do we figure out um, ways to address it and to, to um, make steps to reduce it and to close it. And so that has been a big motivator for my work. I'm a researcher uh, by background and, and training. And so I've spent a lot of time working in uh, organizations that have been um, dedicated to finding um, the evidence about what works, what do we know, what are the effective interventions, and using that information to provide to um, stakeholders and leaders and developers and policymakers who um, need clarity on um what are the approaches, like how, what's the scale of the issue? Um, what are some solutions that are showing promise? Um, how do we think about, um, how do we track the changes and track the, the impact of the work that's happening right now? And so trying to provide like that that measurement and that infrastructure um, to help uh, the people who are doing the on your ground work um, like, um, see, that the pro see the progress that they're making and realize that um, we all have a vested interest in, um, are doing good work to, to close that racial wealth gap. So that, that's what brings me to you and keeps me in this work. Thanks, Stephen. And I hope you guys can now see why I am very excited to have these three talk to me about this because they do have unique perspectives and are full of knowledge. So Stephen, since you're already off mute, well, if you can come back off mute, let's set the stage for today's conversation and give a little bit of the lay of the land from your desk. Sure, uh, great. Uh, can we pull up uh, the slide, please? And so uh, the, that's getting pulled up. I just want to give you a little bit about what we're we're doing. So we just recently released um, a, a report just uh, earlier this week on um, some of the changes in uh, household wealth since the uh, pandemic, looking from 2019 to 2022. I just wanted to, again, provide a little bit of context of um, how wealth has changed for households over the past year, particularly around uh, home ownership. Next slide. So at Aspen, we have done um, a lot of work to try to understand um, wealth building and what wealth looks like for particularly folks who are in the bottom half of the wealth distribution. And so who are the folks in the bottom half distribution? Um, families of color, renters, um, folks who, you know, uh, are often not the folks we think about when we think about, I mean, people in this room, certainly, I think are thinking about these folks a lot, but uh, broadly when we're talking about household wealth and wealth inequality, um, you know, thinking about and trying to bring more focus on the people who um, uh, are working really hard trying to make progress and um, need a broad range of solutions to help them build that household wealth. And so you know, wealth went up, well, the big takeaway from doing uh, research and trying to understand what happened in the past few years is that wealth went up across the board for pretty much everyone in a, a lot of different areas. Um, even for the bottom half of the wealth distribution, which is that green line at the bottom, their wealth almost doubled to $27,000 at the median, which while not a lot, uh, is a sign of a lot of progress um, um, and positive momentum. Uh, next slide. And so when we look at the differences um, across race, you know, the racial wealth gap um, by one, some measures actually uh, got a little bit smaller in terms of um, percentages actually got a little bit smaller, but by dollar amounts, um, it increased because the wealth for that top half, uh, for not top half, but the wealth for um, white households just um, 
has been growing up uh, a bit more rapidly. Um, but the wealth for all households uh, improved, and you can see the the green and blue lines are about for Black and Latino households. Um, you know substantial increases in their wealth over the past few years, just in a three-year period from 2019 to 2022, um, both these households um, saw a yeah, wealth increase um, in excess of $15,000 and close to $20,000 in some cases, um, up to $44,000 the median for Black households and 61 uh, or at the median for Black or for Latino households. So substantial increases in, in wealth for these folks, driven a lot by the people who owned assets, particularly home ownership. Home ownership was a big driver here, and we'll get into that in just a, a minute. Uh, next slide. And even though the racial wealth gap uh, did increase in dollar terms, it did shrink a little bit. Um, and we, we see a little bit of a, a reduction of that gap, in part because of the increased asset ownership and increased asset values so of households of color. And so, um, but even with that reduction, the racial wealth gap is still quite staggering. Um, black households only held 16 cents to the dollar. Um, that white household face Latinos um, only 22 cents to the dollar. So there's still a lot of progress to be made. And so we're still, the work that we're talking about here today about how do we balance the need for increased wealth, but also affordability, access. Like, these are the challenges they're representing here because we want to be able to close these gaps, but right? recognizing that um, uh, when folks are starting from a little bit further back, right, the, the opportunities available um, are a little bit different. So what is what makes the most sense for how we address these issues? And uh, eager for the following conversation. Um, next slide. So turning to home ownership and housing, um, one of the biggest insights, and I think the big fact is, I think this will be a surprise to anyone on this call, um, is that the value of home ownership just really took off over the past few years because of um, you know, we have low interest rates. There is a, a huge shift in demand to people wanting to move to new and different places uh, in order to get a little bit more space or maybe do a little further away from uh, the places they were living before. Um, and you see this in the wealth of riches and homeowners. Right? The homeowners saw their wealth increase $100,000 at the median over the past three years, $100,000. Um, a dramatic, unheard of, unprecedented increase. Uh, the largest on record. Um, while well, renters only saw their, I mean, their wealth increased at a higher rate, but it went from $7,000 to $10,000, a much, much um, um, less dramatic increase. And, and it really does speak to the importance of asset ownership um, and being able to take advantage and to be able to build wealth and home ownership, um, the value of that. And when it does accrue, it's, it's quite um, staggering. It can be quite staggering, quite dramatic for the folks who own it. Um, but I also want to be mindful of the fact that um, there are large portions of um, people of color and, and a lot of other households who are renters. And so when we think about wealth building, uh, it's important to think about not just what it means to increase access to homeownership, but also what do we, how do we build wealth for people who are not yet homeowners or may never be. So um, even though I think it's, it's a pretty strong argument for homeownership, um, you know, it is not going to be accessible to everyone, especially at these higher prices and costs. Um, next slide. Um, and when we look at this across race, um, we see that both the um, for Black households and, and Latino households, actually upticks in home ownership over the past few years and broadly across the board, uh, with the exception of the white households, there was a, a little bit of an uptick um, over the pandemic in home ownership rates. And so um, even with these additional costs, um, I think with the advantage of the lower interest rates, some folks were able to actually um, to be able to enter into home ownership and take advantage of that from equity. Um, next slide, in the final slide here too as well. Um, and so when we look at home equity, which is really what we're talking about when we're talking about home ownership and home, like the wealth from home ownership, um, again, consistent with the, the slide from a couple of slides ago, um, huge gains in home equity for the people who either were homeowners in 2019 or became homeowners in this time period, um, particularly when you look at black, black households, um, a $50,000 increase um, in their home equity over the past few years uh, at the median. And so, um, really dramatic increases here as well for folks who are able to either already be homeowners or be able to get into homeownership. Um, but again, I think on the flip side, and it, this really is like a, a double-headed uh, two-side point here, because um, on one hand, 
this is really wonderful news to the folks who are homeowners and can access home ownership with getting um, that huge wealth increase from um, the equity and the home values going up. But it also means that the prices are going up too, right? We've seen record increases in the home and prices of homes, and and that that equity is is driven in a lot of, in large part by higher home prices, and for, and that makes it a lot harder for folks who have not been able to get a home ownership in the past few years to be able to access it. And so, um, while this is certainly beneficial to the folks who have been able to access home ownership, there is are still major concerns for people. We're still waiting on the sidelines trying to get into home ownership, whether that is through traditional uh, means or through sh shared equity approaches. And so we just wanted to set the stage for what home ownership, um, what the gains have looked like in the past few years, where there have been a lot of upsides, a lot of good news, but also real challenges for the folks who have not yet been able to access home ownership and what that looks like um, for building wealth going forward. So, um, uh, yeah, I right really look forward to the rest of the discussion, but just wanted to provide a little grounding stats for, for where we are at the moment. Thank you, that's the, the end of the presentation. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I love that you brought the data, so we're grounded in that data, and I think you set Kara up really nicely because her work and why she does it really ties into the last set of things you said about shared equity and access to home ownership. So Carol, you give us your lay of the land and set the stage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was taking notes while I was looking at the data as well. Um, so definitely good to see all of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, as Stephen was saying, I mean, there's definitely the the access to home ownership is, is a big concern here with the affordability crisis that we all know about and hear about. I mean, at this point on a daily basis and the news with the people we talk to. Um, and so you know, people are increasingly finding homeownership to be out of reach due to rising home prices and high interest rates. Um, the State of the Nation's housing report, the most recent one, um, said that a household would need an income of $120,000 um, in order to afford the median price home, and only about 6% of renter households are estimated to be able to purchase that median price household. So um, clearly, there's something that need to be, needs to be done here to increase affordability and um, access to homeownership in specific. Um, one way to do this is to um, create homeownership with lasting affordability, um, which is what we are here to, you know, one of the things we're here to talk about today. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful to start, though, by doing some defining of terms. Um, so we've already used a couple of different terms here. Um, we've talked about homeownership with lasting affordability. Um, we've mentioned shared equity housing. Um, that's that's kind of the term that I'm going to define for you is a shared equity homeownership, which is an umbrella term for homeownership where an entity uses a one-time investment of subsidy to offer a home buyer an opportunity to purchase a home at a below market affordable price. And then in exchange, that home buyer agrees to certain restrictions on how the property can be sold and at what price to ensure the home will remain affordable for subsequent home buyers. Um, this is then repeated over and over again with all of the subsequent sales of that home, making the affordability self-sustaining and allowing that initial investment to serve multiple successive generations of home buyers. Um, this can be achieved through a variety of different types of organizations and programs and legal structures. Um, so for example, shared equity housing can be created through community land trusts. Uh, through limited, equ limited equity cooperatives, through deed-restrictive housing. Um, I won't define all of those, but um, what all of these have in common is that there is a legal agreement that outlines how the property, the restrictions associated with the property. Um, there's a steward, which I would call the shared equity um, housing organization, that's responsible for ensuring compliance and maintaining affordability. Um, and this results in you know, shared rights and responsibilities and shared risks and rewards uh, related to the ownership of that property. Um, in terms of the scale of the industry, um, the shared equity model dates back over 50 years and has its roots in the civil rights movement in the South. Um, but it's grown a lot just in the past like decade or so, um, especially with the growing lack of affordability and um, limits to public subsidy that are available. Um, it's been increasingly recognized as a sustainable tool for increasing access to affordable housing, um, providing, serving as an anti-displacement tool and supporting community ownership. Um, there are approximately 250,000 shared equity homes across the country in nearly every state in Washington, D.C. and in Puerto Rico. Um, and I'll just end by talking a little bit about, you know, 
who who's benefiting from the shared equity housing, you know, who's purchasing shared equity um, homes. Um, and so when we're looking at the, the purchasers, 87% of households are first time home buyers. Um, two out of three are family with children, families with children. Um, one out of three is headed by a single mother. 45% uh, are households that are um, headed by a person of color. And um, in terms of affordability, 95% are sold at affordable uh, prices that are affordable to low income households. Um, so up to 80% of AMI and nearly half are affordable to very low income households, up to 50% of AMI at the initial sale. Thank you, Kara. And Jay, I, uh, set the stage for us. What's happening in Atlanta? What's ANDP been up to? What are you seeing? What's your lay of Yeah, so thank you. And you know, I think we've heard a lot of great information so far about options and, 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 and the wealth gap. And so I think what we're seeing in Atlanta is as prices go up, we're just trying to create a diversity of options. So we've been really excited to work with the Atlanta Land Trust, the Decatur Land Trust, to offer this as one of the tools, the proverbial tools in our toolbox, because it's it's not the only tool that's needed to create home ownership, but as prices go up and things get more expensive, it's a great way to uh, provide an, a, another set of options. Um, and I would say that you know we've seen it most successful so far in neighborhoods where prices are becoming even less affordable, and so you know where we've seen it the most success is. You know, uh, you know, in neighborhoods along our Beltline, uh, which is our, our Loop Trail, um, some of our in-town neighborhoods that are just becoming, you know, over the last five years, increasingly unaffordable. And this is just a great way to, to create both the diversity of homeowners in the neighborhood, but also a, um, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a stepping stone to homeownership that might not have otherwise been available. So, um, yeah. So I think that's I think that's the stage that we're setting. Right. Thanks. Uh, Stephen, so your work is heavily focused on wealth building. How does shared equity play a role from your perspective? Yeah, so, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. And I think there are, there's a range of shared equity models. And of course, um, you know, there are some uh, shared equity models where a key part of how they're operating, how they're thinking about um, what their goals are is to help folks build wealth. Um, but there are some that are, are are dedicated to trying to preserve affordability, trying to um, allow residents or other stakeholders to buy into assets. Um, so I think it kind of depends on what the goals are, but I do think it is essential and is an essential tool in the toolbox to, to help well, it's just increased ownership. Um, it's not possible for folks to be able to build wealth without owning something, right? Um, and I think one of the, the big lessons from the past few years is that home ownership uh, is increasingly costly. I mean, there are tre tremendous benefits to, to home ownership, but at the same time, um, it can be a difficult to access. And one of the most expensive assets that folks can can get into. Uh, and so I think um, having other options for people um, that are more accessible, uh, lower costs, um, it, through shared equity and other models, I think really is essential to helping people be able to acquire assets um, and to get, if not the initial stepping uh, on the ladder, like get additional steps and move further up the ladder to wealth building um, as they're um, either on the way to home ownership or um, in absence of it, right? It's just a way for them to to be able to get more assets to build a portfolio. And so I think um, it can be a central tool depending on the goal of the shared equity model. Great. So the goal of the shared equity model, Kara, how does wealth building play a role in that goal of shared, shared equity? How, do, how have you seen it work? Yeah, I mean, thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There are different there are different goals for different um, shared equity housing programs. Um, and essentially, shared equity housing is seeking to balance the individual homeowner and community interests. And you know, each community and each organization kind of has different challenges in their community, different priorities, um, and therefore may implement a program that results in different outcomes. Um, you know, and some may may prioritize more, you know, wealth generation for the specific 
initial homeowner. Others may focus more on, you know, looking kind of more comprehensively at it, like the number of homeowners that will be served and all of the wealth that will be generated over the long term um, perspective. Um, like in terms of mechanics, um, you know, there's there's some similar mechanics, and then you can kind of move some levers to see where you end up on that spectrum. Um, you know, shared equity organizations use a resale formula to determine the maximum price at which a home can be sold. Um, and in general, homeowners do keep the equity that was um, gained from paying down their mortgage and then receive a share of the home's appreciated value. Um, and then each organization is determining um, what the formula is for kind of what that share of the appreciation is that goes directly to that homeowner when they sell. Um, you know, in any case, the difference between the, the market rate price and the resale price is going to be retained in the home. Um, and in order to keep it affordable for the the new the new um, buyer and to keep it affordable for the long term, um, you know, in terms of the outcomes that we see, um, shared equity homeownership does limit the amount of equity that a homeowner can pull out of their home. But we do have research that shows that there's still a significant amount of um, wealth that is generated um, through their ownership of that home. Um, you know, one study found that shared equity homeowners had a median annual net home equity um, gain of about 80% of what other conventional owners had. Again, that will differ from program to program. Um, but I also think it's really important to compare it to like what their situation would have been otherwise. And if in most cases, I think I said 87% um, are first time home buyers, they would have been renters um, until they were able to save up enough to buy a home in the traditional market. Um, and they're very likely, you know, generating more wealth um, with the ownership of this shared equity home than um, than they are as a renter. Um, in general, they're also likely benefiting from like the stable mortgage payment versus, you know, the volatility that you have with a rental payment. Um, and we have found that that modest wealth generation is still usually often enough to serve as a stepping stone into the traditional market if that's what they choose to do. So um, when shared equity homeowners do sell their, their properties, um, about uh, nearly 60% of them are moving into traditional homeownership, at which point they then have access to those uh, tr you know traditional gains as well. Um, and kind of the last thing I would just note is, you know, I think one of the other benefits of uh, strong shared equity housing programs is um, that they're providing that stewardship as well to really support the homeowner and ensuring that they succeed um, with their their homeownership journey. Um, there's a lot of, you know, most require initial homeownership counseling, a lot provide, you know, subsequent um, financial counseling or um, homeownership support, help with maintaining properties, help with identifying, um, you know, contractors that could do repairs and things like that. Um, and you know, we've also seen that that shared equity homeowners are less likely to lose their homes in foreclosure. So during the foreclosure crisis, uh, shared equity homes were 10 times less likely to be in foreclosure proceedings than private market homes. Um, and we think that has a lot to do both with that initial affordability and that ongoing support. Thank you. And and Jay, I feel like you've, you've seen wealth building, you've seen shared equity, you've seen the different models using home ownership. Could you talk a little bit about that? What's your view on the two things and how they work? Yes, and um, you know, I, I don't think that they are mutually exclusive, kind of dovetailing off what Kara was saying. Um, it may be less wealth, right, created because you have a little bit of that limitation on the back end. But I think even historically thinking about the fact that um, the last 15 years have been wildly a roller coaster in home ownership values, but traditionally in a lot of markets, you know, massive appreciations that don't happen. Right? Um, so just having the stability, knowing that you're going to get some of your principal back, maybe the down payment that came in from a, a public source that, that is forgiven, uh, maybe your initial down payment comes back and then that's stable principal and interest payment through the life of your loan is huge towards wealth creation. So I don't see them as mutually exclusive. Now, I do agree that you have to weigh the pros and cons of the fact that there is some limitation to the amount of wealth or equity or appreciation that you're going to see. And so, um, you know, especially in, in neighborhoods seeing massive reinvestment or massive gentrification, you are going to see uh, less growth um, than you might 
But again, I, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. And I think if the goal is to create home ownership opportunities, create stability and create some equity that you could support you down the line, then shared equity still meets all of those goals in some way. So and thanks. I think all of you kind of touched on the point that it is there, it is not the only way. It is one way to get a wealth building. It's for us, we think of it as a spectrum. There are many different models you can support of home ownership. Shared equity just happens to be one of them. And it is for certain subset of the population that may not otherwise be able to purchase a home that may be a renter. So I'm, I'm very happy that you all brought that out because to my initial top of mind thought, do they have to compete? I think we're getting to a place where we are, we're thinking, no, they don't, right? It's just a, not one of the tools in our toolkit. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the challenges that you're seeing um, on the home ownership and or the wealth um, gap front of things. Any Anyone can kick us off on that. Well, I, I can start, I guess. One of the limitations that we've seen in Atlanta is just the amount of public or philanthropic funding available to help make the the, um, the units viable. So even though we're a nonprofit and you know, our mission is affordable housing, uh, we don't have, we can't do every unit in this model because we can't um, afford to uh, donate the land value uh, to the project. So I think that's one of the limitations. Um, but, you know, just like you said, John, that even if we could, I don't know that it would be the right answer because it isn't the right tool for every or the right option for every buyer. So um, that's one of the limitations that I would see. I can jump in. Um, I mean, I, I would agree on the the funding. Um, I mean, I talked before about, you know, access to subsidy in general. Um, you know, one of the great things about shared equity housing is it, it is kind of self-sustaining for specific units in terms of, you know, ideally once the, the subsidy is in, it's going to just stay in um, to maintain the affordability long term. But if you want to expand a portfolio and bring new units in, um, you do typically need, you know, a, a substantial amount of subsidy in order to do that um, and to make that home affordable and, you know, at a price that's not just affordable, but also attractive to be, you know, purchasing into a shared equity model. Um, and so I would second the the funding. Um, and I would say, you know, that that's something we hear from our members um, all the time. In fact, uh, my team uh, at Grounded Solutions was developed kind of specifically in response to that. Um, and we are charged with trying to develop um, capital and real estate strategies that support um, shared equity housings and housing organizations and scaling their portfolios. Um, and, you know, I'll just say one of the ways that we're doing that is we are uh, kind of piloting um, an initiative that seeks to figure out a way to develop that subsidy without subsidy. Um, so we have an initiative called Homes for the Future. It's going to be our first real estate fund. Um, and we are in this model, we are drawing from um, kind of two proven models, the real estate investment fund model for single family rentals that you've probably seen buying up homes in communities um, by the for-profit model um, and the shared equity housing model um, to create a pipeline of affordable homes that are subsidized by market forces um, rather than public subsidy. So essentially we're using that infrastructure on the single family rental um, side to acquire the homes ourselves um, and hold them as rental for a period of time while we can um, generate the um, necessary appreciation and kind of pay down debt so that eventually we can transfer them into shared equity portfolios directly and kind of have self-subsidized that affordable sale. So definitely aware of that issue and are trying to come up with um, some creative solutions to it um, as well. A couple, I guess, quick additions. I mean, echoing what's already been said around the, do you pay for this? The financing is obviously a, can be quite a challenge um, to not just shared equity models, but I, I think to any form of um, development that is um, meant to uh, build wealth for um, low to moderate income families. And so I think just trying to find the financing I think is often um, a challenging piece of this. But I think the other thing that I've been reflecting on recently is that even for folks who are a little bit higher on the income spectrum, right, the cost between the difference in um, what affordability looks like um, for entering into home ownership has just gotten um, pretty extreme over the past few years. And so um, we're seeing just increasing affordability challenges, even for folks who are. Um, 
you know, middle class and up a little bit um, for access. And they're, you know, those folks, I mean, depending on the model, can be, um, uh, might not be able to access some of the shared equity models, again, depending on the model. And so I think um, there's, uh, it's, it, it's challenging you know, to, to think about like, um, what, what the options are, but I recognize that homeownership for a lot of people has just gotten to the point of entering homeownership has gotten to the point of being um, so unaffordable that even folks who a generation ago would have been able to quite easily afford a phone ownership or, or struggling to get into it. And we don't have a lot of solutions beyond family wealth um, to increase access to, to some of those folks. And think a lot about people who are graduating from college, we have high student loan debt, but maybe making solid incomes. Um, it, it, there are real challenges there for that group as well. Yeah, um, it's expensive. And we we grapple with that in my side of the business too, because we are looking at you know what it takes to build and the cost to build a house is not changing, regardless of if your buyer is an affordable buyer or a, reg or a regular buyer, so to speak, in the market. So you are constantly thinking of what is available on the subsidy level. And whilst it's going to be affordable for the long term via some type of a model, you still need to build the homes. And we are at 250,000, but there's such a need because the home prices are so high for more affordability, for more affordable home ownership options that the subsidy needed is very, very critical to making these projects work. Um, we're seeing, uh, I think, interest now, a lot more interest in the markets around what, how can we support this model? Perhaps it's using LIHTC or you market tax credits. So there are lots of interest, but there's the need is still the same. You have to find quite a lot of initial capital to put into making the projects affordable. And we're glad that the conversations are happening and that there's more interest from different types of funding sources to play a role um, in that market. So um, all great points. We're getting a lot of questions. I wanna acknowledge that we do have questions and there is a Q and A section. So I will come to your questions. I didn't want to pause the discussion. Um, our final question really in closing is, what are what are some of the things you're grappling with? And I think you've touched on some of these, each of you. What are some of the things you're grappling with as you consider wealth inequality and the role of home ownership? And, and anyone can start. Um, I mean, I'll start. I mean, I think, um... I guess I, I do grapple with the fact that, you know, obviously I'm, I'm focused on expanding um, housing with lasting affordability, um, but, you know, I know it's not the only, like the only solution and it can't solve the problem and, you know, there needs to be, um, you know, more done. So I, I do grapple with the, um, the idea that, you know, you can be working so hard on something and, and know that it's still only a small piece of the puzzle. But um, I also take heart in that, knowing that there's other people kind of working on that puzzle as well on other aspects on it that we can, um, you know, work together and, and build a, a greater whole through all of those efforts. Um, you know, in terms of shared, you know, equity housing and specific um, and home owner, shared equity home ownership in specific, I would say, um, no, it's not going to completely solve the racial wealth gap, but I definitely think it needs to be part of the solution. Um, and, you know, homeownership does continue to be a main source of wealth generation. So we we need to figure out ways to make this uh, this more ac um, accessible and um, shared equity housing is a, a great, you know, addition to the spectrum we've been talking about of um, housing options since it can, you know, expand and accelerate access. Um, and it can stretch the impact of each of those um, limited investments. You know, I think for me in Atlanta, one of the things we're grappling with and um, the shared equity becomes a good tool to help with this, but um, just the rise in prices and the higher interest rates. And during <clears throat> COVID, prices went up but interest rates went down. So nobody really minded. And now that interest rates are up and prices are still up, you know, we're just grappling every day with how do we keep delivering homes that are affordable to 80% AMI and 120% AMI buyers. Um, so no easy answers, but I think shared equity is definitely part of the solution. Mm, just echoing um, both of the perspectives. I, I think um, we especially given the affordability challenges. Um, we, we, we have often, as a country, kind of 
really pointed to home ownership as as the way for families to be able to build wealth. And it is without a doubt an essential way for families to build wealth. But I, I think I, I see shared equity um, and not just shared equity, um, home ownership, but you know, other sh uh, shared equity models and other forms of wealth building as options in a broader portfolio tool for families to be able to get into wealth building more generally so that we don't have to look at um, buying a traditional home with a traditional mortgage is the only way that families can build wealth. I mean, people need other access and other tools, um, especially given the expense. Uh, you know, not everyone is going to have um, the resources to be able to put a uh, 10% down payment on a $500,000 home um, and then be able to maintain it with those costs. So I think being able to um, have a wider array of options for folks to be able to get into asset ownership to be able to to buy a house the advantages of being like think about the dichotomy if it's just renting and just home ownership i showed you that graph earlier about what the wealth difference is between renters and homeowners like we need other options in between um and share equity is uh, i think a really promising and encouraging option Thank you. The chat is heating up. Uh, we have quite a few questions. I'm not sure we'll get through all of them, but I will try to go in order and anyone can answer. If I think it was meant for a specific person, I will try to flag that. The first question, I think Kara may have touched on this a little bit. Does a shared equity home provide incentives to the occupant that renting does for many who traditionally pursue home ownership as an investment? Yeah, I mean, I think again, this will depend kind of on the on the specific shared equity kind of program that you're involved with. Um, I mean, I think a lot in terms of um, you know, like a community land trust for for instance, you know, the way their governance is structured, there's an opportunity to play a role in like you know getting a seat on the board and and the governance of the entity. So really getting some some democratic involvement um, in the entity. Um, also, a lot of different programs offer different things in terms of their, um, like, the stewardship that they provide. So not necessarily, you know, a specific incentive, but they they will offer tools to you to help you support to support you in your um, homeownership journey that um, you would not typically get, you know, in, from a renter, from a, sorry, from a landlord in terms of, you know, access to financial counseling um, and things like that that can support your overall wealth um, building journey, um, as well as things, you know, I've, I've often thought um, things I would love to be able to take advantage of as a homer myself, um, in terms of like, you know, training on home maintenance, um, reminders on home maintenance, help vetting contractors, things like that, that just, um, there are a lot of things about homeownership that are that are hard um, and are especially hard if you're a first generation home buyer. Um, you know, I, I am a first generation home buyer. I can't ask my parents how to do a lot of these things. Um, and it would be lovely to have, you know, some resources that could kind of guide me along that way and help make sure that um, I'm proceeding in the right way. So not necessarily specific investments, but um, our incentives, but, um, but definitely a lot of additional supports provided in the space. Since you're off mute, Kara, I have a question. So someone's asking, you mentioned 250,000 shared or home ownership units across the U.S. Are there states or localities that are more interested in pro promoting shared equity? There are for sure. Um, I cannot claim to know that off the top of my head, but I will direct you um, in terms of like the 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 locations of existing shared equity housing organizations. Um, we do we do a shared equity housing um, census. Um, that we have updated recently, um, and we have a map of those groups on our website. So I would direct you to the Grounded Solutions Network website where you can um, see a map of organizations. That's a little limited. Um, it is specifically focused on um, community land trusts and nonprofit um, shared equity housing organizations. So it doesn't necessarily cover everything that would fit more broadly into shared equity housing, but it's a really good place to start um, and see see what's going on nationally, but also in your specific neck of the woods. Great, thank you. Uh, this question might work for Jay. Do homeowners debating whether to opt into a shared equity model tend to understand the trade-offs in the lower wealth building versus the benefits of the model? Um, the person's saying it can be easy for us, but does the average person, are they swayed at all by those trade-offs? The second part of the question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, 
I would say that, you know, one of the key things that we found in Atlanta and the land trust in Decatur is sort of a home buyer information session. So the land, the local land trust does a lot of education with the home buyer at the beginning to walk them through how the model works. Um, and I think really just providing in plain language what what the benefits are and some of the trade-offs. So um, given that we've been successful with these home buyers, I think most of them are seeing that value. But uh, um, you know, again, the key is just that, that, that information session early before you get them locked into a specific home so that they have the chance to go away the those accounts. Thank you. Next question, um, I'm going to try to summarize this one based on my understanding. Is there any research within the shared equity model that looks at well-building through just living in the stable home, so access to better jobs, better, more investment in retirement or the stock market, so kind of like the ripple effect of what it means to live in stable housing or through the shared equity model? Um. I'm trying to think through um, the exact research studies I've looked at. I don't know if all of those specific things are covered, you know, directly in any one specific study. I mean, we have we have been doing research and have, you know, other groups are, have as well um, on, you know, the, the results um, for homeowners that are in shared equity housing. And we do know some things like um, after looking at certain subsets like average wealth generation, um, as well as, you know, just quality of life indicators, you know, for instance, um, one I know off the top of my head is that, you know, we've asked about like the sense of home that people feel and if they still feel like it's the same sense of owning a home, um, which they do when when having a shared equity home. So, you know, sometimes people from the outside may think, oh, it seems like a a lesser version of home ownership, but the people living in in those units are not feeling that way. Um, and there there has been some research in terms of like the, the communities they're moving from and into and the stability generated from there. Um, I don't know them all off the top of my head, but if someone would like to reach out to me, I can definitely point you to some of those uh, those research studies. Thank you. And I can't so this... speak, Sorry, Go ahead, say just briefly. I can't speak directly to this question, but I, I will say from other work that we've done on assets um, and more broadly, is that there just isn't a lot of study around um, like how home ownership is balanced or within like a broader sort of like a broader set of assets, and so I would be surprised um, to see if there were, if there were existing research out there that says um, this is the impact of shared equity on increased retirement savings. I I would be surprised if that study is out there, but um, someone should do it because I think it, it is it would be interesting to see what the increased benefits of housing stability and the likely lower housing costs compared to renting, um, like what those trade-offs would be. But um, yeah, that's a really important question. I've got one for you, Stephen. I think I want you to, could you talk about the role of transforming the modern mortgage system in allowing more access to home ownership and wealth building? Um, I mean, <laughs> I'll say that one is certainly, uh, beyond my pay grade expertise. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, as a, you know, uh, I, I will not claim to have deep expertise into how to reform the mortgage finance system. I will, I will say that um, it is, mortgage, like the financing, it's just reflective of the underlying cost of the asset, right? And so if the assets are going to be quite expensive to purchase, then, you know, the financing is going to be tricky. And I think we, um, you know, folks have been trying to think through other options, whether um, how do we uh, either lower the down payments or increase um, the um, uh, the credit strength of the folks or like change the credit scoring to make things more accessible. Um, but the underlying assets are quite expensive and then, you know, the financing can only go so far. Uh, I know there's a talk um, I've heard, you know, uh, mentioned every now and then around potential 40 year mortgage, but, you know, even with something like that, the um, interest rates on the upfront end will be really challenging for homeowners. So I, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question, but it, it, I think there's an issue with the underlying cost there. Sorry, go ahead, Jay. Thank uh, you. Just, for kind of a, just a little bit and just say, I mean, I think the mortgage question, though, does speak to a key, which is 
having local loan loan officers and banks willing to work with you on the mortgage side. Um, and one of the things that's been heartening for me in Atlanta has been that since we started working with the land trust model five years ago, we're seeing more banks and more lending facilities available. So um, I don't think that's fixing the underlying mortgage system per se, as the question was asked, but just it's it's been exciting to see more banks getting involved. And they're realizing that it's not a bad investment. There's no real risk. Um, no more risk, I should say, than any other. So. Yeah. Yeah, I can just add to that. Yeah, we have similarly focused on education around that, whether that be education, you know, um, you know, related to to the mortgages for the home buyers, um, and understanding that there really is no no additional risk for um, doing a mortgage on a shared equity housing property um, compared to a traditional property, um, and then we also do. Um, you know, lender kind of outreach and education about um, lending to shared equity housing organizations as well um, to, you know, because they need capital too in order to um, to, to, to manage their programs and to, to buy properties. And I can attest that we have benefited from GSN's partnership and their teachings on homeownership. So when new loan officers join NHT, they go to GSN to learn as much as they can. Um, you mentioned some stats, Karen. A few people are asking the average amount of time that a homeowner owns a shared equity home. So Karen, maybe Jay, you might have some perspective on this as well. I don't I don't know the average overall. Um, again, I could look and see if I, I could find that. Um, a lot of the studies are kind of like subsets of individual portfolios. Um, I I, you know, some of them I've seen, you know, in that particular subset, they were looking at like the sales occurring after seven years or whatnot, but um, it really has been, what I've looked at has really been specific to subsets of portfolios. So I don't think I could say for the, the overall, um, what the average tenure is. Yeah, I think our, our experience in Atlanta is still too new to speak to it, but I would say just generally within the affordable space in Atlanta, we studied our home buyers that had been in the home for five years or more, and 95% of them were still in their homes at the five year mark. Um, and only um, less than 1% had gone through a foreclosure. Um, again, that's the general affordable space, not the shared equity space, but I would imagine that the shared equity would be as good or better um, than what we've seen elsewhere. Do you think there's an optimal way to balance the goal of permanent affordability and wealth generation? You know, I, I think I mentioned this earlier. I think I think each community is gonna have to make that that assessment themselves. Um, you know, it really you can you can move along a spectrum and I think each community is gonna know what their what they're struggling with the most, what, what they're anticipated, what their concerns are, how much they're dealing with, you know, displacement, how much prices are rising, how quickly, what they can expect to be continuing in the future. Um, and, you know, they'll really have to just look at at the the environment on the ground there. And that's kind of one of the nice things about it being a, a somewhat more localized approach um, to the, on that final um, decision is that you're, you're able to come up with the right solution for your community and your needs. Um, and so, no, I don't know that I could say that there's a specific one that's that's better, even if I might have a preference. <laughs> um, Any other thoughts of that magic place of how to balance it? I mean, the only thing I would say is, you know, probably not too far on either extreme, right? In terms of like, um, you know, we obviously, you know, for us to say it's lasting affordability, we're looking for it to be staying lasting um, over time. And so something that, you know, allowed all the appreciation to to go to a homeowner, would you would likely not be able to maintain that as affordability, um, as affordable over time. But also I think, I think most people in this space absolutely are looking for there to be some level of wealth generation. And so do you want homeowners to be walking away with something for sure? I'll if they say, choose like, to walk know, away. You know. In Atlanta, one of the early projects that had done the shared equity <clears throat> did not cap the appreciation on the back end. And just to speak to one of the experiences that they had, um, when those units were resold, it, it really required the new capital. So just just to kind of maybe say it a different way, 
you know, the reason why you sort of cap that appreciation is that you're trying to prevent the land trusts or the shared equity models from having to re recapitalize the project at each sale. And so there's sort of that balance point. And I think we're all trying to find what's the right amount. Um, one of the early projects we did, we had done like a 2% appreciation. Well, at that time, that seemed better than inflation. And, um, you know, now we're seeing that may not have been the right number. Uh, there's one question that I will answer. Um, does shared equity only work for new built versus older homes? So limited equity co-ops is a type of shared equity and that is existing. So the short answer is no, it works for both. It doesn't just have to be new built. Just wanted to quickly answer that one. I don't think we'll get to all of our questions. Um, we will likely send contact information. At least you'll have mine. So you can feel free to follow up and I can direct your questions in the right to the right place. We may have room for one more question before we wrap up. Let me see what that question might be. So this one's for people that are already living in the homes. How do you incentivize repairing and investing in these homes? So, you know, someone's gonna live in them for a long time and you're thinking of the affordability and who has to buy it next. How do you get that homeowner that's currently in there to understand the importance of repairing and investing in the homes when they're only going to share in a part of the appreciation? Yeah, um, well, a lot of that is is also, you know, part of the stewardship that's so that the shared equity housing organization is, you know, involved in and, and responsible for. Um, they won't necessarily go into your house and do the repairs for you, but that's where a lot of education comes in, um, as well as providing um, resources and tools. So like I said, that can range from anything to providing, you know, workshops that teach you how to do repairs yourself, uh, reminders on kind of it's getting colder. These are things you should do to, you know, some might have a tool library where they loan tools out to different homeowners. So um, really making it clear, like providing supports. Um, and then also in the, the resale formula, you can, um, you can include things that require um, repairs to be made as needed. And that would potentially reduce the price that went to the, to the homeowner um, to cover the cost of the repairs. Thank you for that. Um, any last words? We have a minute. I see a couple of other questions. I apologize for not being able to get to them, but we can have our panelists follow up. Any last words from our panelists before we wrap up? No, I just say, you know, thank you for, for having me. Um, and I enjoyed having this conversation with all of you. Um, and so, yeah, just take a look at shared equity um, and learn more about it. Um, it's It's worth understanding so you can have a new tool in, in your toolbox. Anyone else? It was great to be here today and uh, also learning a few more stats from Stephen. So, but thanks for the questions. Yeah, thank you for the invite and um, my tip my hat to all the practitioners who are doing this work and uh, helping families um, build more wealth and get into, get into home ownership. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think we're we're all going away being filled with a lot more ideas and thought and stats, right, on just what's happening. Um, we're all working towards the common good of benefiting our communities with one way or the other. Home ownership is one tool towards wealth building and um, whether it be shared equity or it is traditional home ownership, there's a role for each model to play as we work towards wealth generation, particularly um, as we've heard communities of color benefit from wealth generation through home ownership. So that makes me pretty excited in the work that we do. I'm here at NHT. We support all models and are very happy to always facilitate conversations that spark thought, that bring about innovation, and that continues the, di the dialogue to get us to solutions. So thank you all for joining us and thank you to my panelists. Any further questions, feel free to email me and I can get them to the right person. Thank you.